Hello and welcome to What It Takes. I'm Tom Landon. Sometimes when we think about people with substance use issues, we can be pretty judgmental. It can be easy to blame people for the choices they make, and once we do that, it can be hard to have a lot of sympathy for them. In the last decade or so, though, researchers and practitioners have been moving to a new way of thinking that seeks to treat those with substance use disorder just like we do anyone else suffering from a medical condition. I know that my own thinking on this subject has evolved largely because I'm married to a journalist who spent a chunk of her career writing about people who use heroin. My guest today is Danny Clausen. They're with the Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition, a Roanoke organization that is deeply involved working with people with substance use disorders by literally meeting them where they are and providing the things they need most to survive another day, which includes distribution of both overdose mitigation drugs like Narcan and running a needle exchange, which helps stop the spread of communicable diseases like HIV and hepatitis in our community. Welcome, Danny. I'm really glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. Before we talk about some of the issues I, I mentioned in the opening, I always like to just start by, by asking my guests, you know, how did you end up here? What, what's your background? And what, what brought you to where you are now? Yeah, so it was actually my fiance. Um, so me and my fiance met in Atlanta where I was doing political advocacy work um, specifically for LGBTQ rights. And then uh, she got into medical school up here. She goes to Virginia Tech um, at the Carilion School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and so she brought me um, up here. And uh, she actually also is the person that got me into harm reduction. She was on the board of the Atlanta Harm Reduction Coalition. And through her, I got connected to them and would do a lot of volunteer work and coordination. We did a lot of voter registration with their clients down there. That was one of my mm -hmm. primary activities um, down in Georgia with um, getting out the vote and getting people registered to vote. So uh, when I came up here, um, we found the local harm reduction organization and got involved and um, eventually um, a position um, for the executive director opened up and uh, I was selected to fill that role. And that's been a, it's been a, a, a rapidly kind of growing group that's mission is changing. So, but um, how do you explain what is harm reduction for somebody who has like no idea, never heard the phrase before? So to everybody, I explain harm reduction first and foremost as love. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about harm reduction, about what it is and what it is not. Um, and we can get into that as we continue our conversation, but it's really important to me that people understand that what motivates us every day and why anybody gets into this work is love. We care about the people that are suffering in our communities, especially here in Appalachia, in Western Virginia. Um, we've been hit really, really hard by the opioid epidemic. And, um, you know, prior to the current situation our country is in, I think there was a lot of harsh judgments and still are a lot of harsh judgments towards people who use drugs. And um, we come from a perspective that everybody is human. Everybody deserves love, caring, dignity, respect. And actually, at the end of the day, a lot of the research is showing that the opposite of addiction actually isn't sobriety, it's connection. And so what we try to do with harm reduction is reconnect with people that have been cast off by the rest of society, that have been left to languish on their own. We go to them and we say, hey, I see you. You're a human being and you deserve care and respect. And I'm here to work with you towards your own goals and betterment and try to reconnect these communities back into um, society so that they can start putting their lives back together and um, move forward. I want to step back to something you said that I think is really interesting that the opposite, you know, the, the opposite of, of I, I'm going to get it wrong, what yeah. you talked about, you know, it's, it's all about connection, not necessarily total abstinence or sobriety, right? right? And that can be a tough sell to many in the, even the treatment community. Yeah. So um, the fact that you all are out there T tell me what it's like when you're out there talking to someone who is a drug user mm -hmm. and they come to you for the first time. What's their experience been like before that probably with treatment, with, mm. uh, you know, addiction services, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, people that are in chaotic use and to be really clear, when we talk about um, addiction and substance use, we, you know, harm reduction states that not all drug use is similar, not all substance use is similar. Many people enjoy a glass of wine every night with their dinner. That's substance use, right? That's daily substance use. But we're not saying, oh, you have a problem and you're a bad person and you have to be locked up and all that kind of stuff. 
So we understand that drug use and substance use exists along a spectrum. And so in that spectrum, we talk about chaotic use. And that's what most people think about when they think about drug use. They think about people that have lost, you know, um, homes, jobs, lost connection with their family members, or living out on the streets, living in really deplorable conditions. That's what most people think when they talk about drug use. And we call that chaotic use, whereas um, more stable use is somebody that, for example, uses marijuana, cannabis, to treat their pain or their anxiety, and that they can, you know, a lot of people who are addicted to opioids eventually are able to get off the opioids and only manage their symptoms with cannabis. Um, we call that harm reduction, right? Heroin um, is a very consequential substance. It does a lot of harm to your body, right? And so what we're trying to do is move people away from the most harmful things to the less harmful things. And those clients like that, they are able that, that use marijuana to manage their symptoms. They're able to have jobs. They're able to be, you know, have families and be productive members of societies and live happy, healthy lives. And, and yet there are those who really, really disagree with that idea, right? right? They yeah. say, if you are, if you have an addiction issue, the only solution is total abstinence. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I get that. And I know that AA has been a wonderful thing for so many people. But what kind of problems can that mindset cause when you are meeting somebody with chaotic drug right. use? Yeah, so to get back to your original question, when I meet somebody um, that, that we really try and target those chaotic users, because we want to move them outside, you know, from chaos to stability. Um, and so when I meet someone like that, we take their intake information, um, kind of get information on where they're staying, what their drugs of choice are, what kind of resources that they have, just so that we know kind of where the gaps are. Um, and then we offer them um, whatever services they request. So we have wound care um, services that we do. We do case management services. So we have case managers on our staff that will connect people to housing that if somebody is actually interested in treatment, we will connect them to um, residential um, addiction treatment, right? Um, but, so we but residential treatment can be a problem because it's 28 days or, so, or a mm -hmm. month or two weeks or whatever away from your life. Mm -hmm. That's not really feasible for many people, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's also age um, outpatient programs. Really what we try to focus on is the client identifies their needs. I actually worked in addiction treatment services for several years. Um, I was an admissions counselor at a program that served women with children, and I was a residential counselor at a program that served teenagers who were addicted. And in both of those programs, something that I learned very early on is you cannot force somebody into sobriety. You cannot force somebody to take their treatment seriously, to pay attention in groups, to take advantage of all the therapy. And so we come from a mindset of why would we waste dollars forcing people into a program that they're not ready for yet, right? Whereas if we're coming from, you tell me what you need, because a lot of our clients, yeah, they want to get sober, but that is so far down on their list, right? Because they don't have a place to sleep and it's freezing outside. Uh, they don't have food to eat. They don't have clean clothes. And so what we do is we let them identify what they need and we build trust that way. They say, I, I need clothes. We bring them clothes. I need, um, you know, Narcan to keep them safe. We do that. We bring them Narcan. We build trust that way and take care of the needs that they identify. And then once they're ready for treatment, then we will connect them for treatment. But we're not pushing anybody because you can't force somebody into recovery. So what we really do is work with them in a partnership um, and and get them to the place where they feel that they are stable, that they have achieved their goals. And the studies show that this works. Um, studies show that, and this is on the CDC website, that if um, a person is participant in a harm reduction program, they're five times more likely to enter treatment. Right. And we know um, that people with uh, especially opioid use disorder, I mean, they may go to treatment if they are in the traditional, you're going to go away to treatment, it's maybe eight or ten times before they have yes. any success, right? Yes. The washout rate of the, many of those programs is pretty high. And that's where we come in. I, I see us as a safety net. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> that's where we come in. I see that as us as a safety net that um, relapse is a part of recovery. Every recovery and addiction specialist will tell you that relapse is a part of recovery. Well, when that relapse happens, who's there to catch them? Because they can't be in those programs. They have strict protocols. So we're there to catch them and say like, hey, 
You're going to get there. Just keep trying. What do you need? Here's some Narcan. Go slow. Because what we hear a lot um, in the past is you got to let them hit rock bottom. You got to let them, um, you know, you got to cut them off. You got to let them figure their stuff out. Well, with fentanyl infecting the drug supply at such an extreme degree right now, rock bottom is death. Right. And, and we believe and everybody deserves to live, right? We want to keep people alive long enough so that they can get the help they need. Yeah, and, and fentanyl is, is, is a huge issue. I know it's now, you know, it's showing up in many more things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not sure if you all are doing this. I kind of assume you are, but in terms of like testing uh, strips and that sort of thing so that um, people can actually test their own supply so that they know what they're ingesting. And that, I know that's been controversial for some, like what are we, why are we helping these people mm -hmm. to break the law? Mm. Um, but again, uh, and I don't know how long, you've been in doing this a little while, you know, how has the landscape changed since the sort of blowing up of, of the presence of fentanyl? Yeah, it's completely different. And I think what people don't, I think people are finally starting to understand um, because it's it's coming into their house, right? Everybody I know has lost a close personal connection to opioid overdose, right? In the 1980s, at the height of the drug war, the national overdose average was around $9,000 a year, or 9,000 people, around 9,000 people a year were overdosing. Last year, it was 103,000. This is an absolute crisis. And so I can understand people saying like, you know, um, why, why are we enabling is the word that you hear a lot. Why are we enabling these people? But to me, when people say that, it really breaks my heart because what they're saying to me, what the undercurrent of that is, I'm okay if this human being dies and we're not okay with that. Right. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we recently had a, a, a president who who used the phrase harm reduction in the mm -hmm. State of the Union um, address. And I, that, you know, I, I saw from Twitter and other things, we looked, that people, that popped up right away. People yeah. like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Um, what does it mean to the harm reduction community to sort of be recognized as doing good work and not being you know, these fringe people out on the side? I gotta tell you, it's a little disorienting <laughs> um, because we are used to being very fringe. This movement, the harm reduction movement came out of the late 80s, early 90s. It came up with the AIDS um, fight and the AIDS movement. Um, and so people were realizing that you know, serious diseases were being spread through injection drug use like hepatitis C and HIV. And so they came up as a way to like, hey, we don't want um, you know, our loved ones and, and you know, again, human beings being um, infected with these very serious infections. And so they came up and just started doing the work out of a backpack. Most harm reduction programs I know, it started with a guy in a backpack who usually is in recovery himself has re her or herself, has achieved recovery and are going back for people. And when I talk about that, I get chills because again, that's what this is about. Harm reduction is about love. It's going back to get the people that you left behind, your community um, that was left behind. So when um, we talk about it being in the State of the Union, it's, it's very exciting, but also very disorienting because now everybody's talking about you and you're used to just being in your little corner underneath the bridge, minding your own business, and now we're um, all over the media. It's a tremendous opportunity though, because it allows us to educate people. It allows us to come on programs like this one. You know, people are hearing a lot by har about harm reduction, but I have found that most people don't actually know much about harm reduction. They've heard it, they've looked it up, they have a, an idea of what it is, um, but there's actually eight principles um, that are um, promoted through harmreduction.org. Um, it's our national harm reduction organization that supports smaller organizations like ours. I highly recommend everybody go look at harmreduction.org, look at their principles um, and help you know, we want to help communities understand the work that we're doing. Now that the spotlight's on us, it's a tremendous opportunity to educate. Now, I've been using the term, and I used it in my introduction, and you've used it too, um, of opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. This is not how we have always referred to people. Mm -hmm. um, how important, you know, people may be watching at home and going, what, what is this language they're using? They're mm -hmm. using all this jargon, but why is it important to think about people as having a medical condition yeah. instead of, 
just making bad choices. Oh, absolutely. It's really, really important. And it is a medical condition. It has its own, in hospitals, doctors um, diagnose people and, and put in information through ICD codes. That, that kind of legitimizes, like, this is a, a, a diagnosable illness. It has its own ICD code. It has, I mean, we spend hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars on treatment for this. It's not a choice. And all the science backs that up, right? Um, I met once a, a young man in um, Western Virginia, in West Virginia. We were doing some outreach there, and he was helping us. He was an adult. He was a volunteer for our program, and he was sharing that the first time that he injected heroin, he was 11 years old, yep. and he was shown by his cousin. And that is really reflective of what's happened in this region. Um, for, and, and you had said earlier that you were going to talk much about dope sick, but I actually talk about dope sick all the time um, because what we found through that reporting um, was that the Sacklers and Purdue for Pharma flooded this region in the most irresponsible way with opioids. And then once people, once the government found out what was happening, they cut the opioid supply off. So you had all these people that were addicted to very serious drugs and then they had no source for those drugs that were originally given to them by their doctors. So what do they do? They turn to heroin. And that's how you get intergenerational use, um, where grandparents are showing their grandkids how to use heroin. It's heartbreaking. So when you talk about a choice, what choice did that 11-year-old boy have, right? When your brain is, is taking in these chemicals at such a vulnerable time, because most opioid use disorder is happening in teenagers and young adults in their 20s, early 30s. Um, we're seeing the most overdoses in that population, right? When you look at that population and, you know, your brain doesn't fully begin or complete developing until you're 26. So if you're washing your brain in these chemicals, it that's where things like methadone and suboxone, which are two medicated assistant treatment, you know, when your brain has been relying on this medication, this substance, for years, to think that you can just go cold turkey, that your brain chemistry hasn't been fundamentally changed by that, that you don't need something like marijuana or Suboxone, something to help you function properly, um, I think is just, people that think that it's just a lack of knowledge and understanding of the depth and severity of that problem. So the way I look at people that are addicted um, to these substances, I look at them as, as quite frankly, um, even though this can be some stigmatizing language, I look at them as victims of the Sackler and the Purdue and that we should be giving them compassion because they didn't ask for this. This was thrust upon them. Right. And people can say, oh, it's your choice and all of that. Um, but if anybody has ever suffered from addiction, and I'm sure many of your viewers have, you know, there's a lot of different substances. There's a lot of people that have suffered and beat alcoholism, right? Um, you know, there's, there's something happening in your brain that's telling you, especially with opioid withdrawal, that you're going to die. Your brain is telling you, you will die. If you don't get more of this If you don't get an opioid in here. Your entire chemistry is telling you that. So when people say, oh, just say no, that's, that's not possible. It, it, it is fundamentally not possible. And all the science and all the data supports that. And so when we talk about people who use drugs, when we talk about opioid use disorder, what we're trying to do is stay away from stig stigmatizing language like addict, junkie, user. Those are incredibly stigmatizing and otherizing. We're trying to focus on this is somebody's sister. This is somebody's brother, father, son, cousin, uncle. This is someone to not only a family member, but to us. You are someone to us, and we care about you, and we recognize your humanity, first and foremost, which is why we choose words like people who use drugs as opposed to drug user. Right, that makes sense. Um, uh, the late Tess Henry, who was profiled in Dope Sick, and it's hard not to keep coming back to it, um, but uh, she told the author, Beth Macy, she said, you know, what we need is urgent care for the addicted because she kept running into walls when she would try to get treatment and fail or she couldn't get on get, couldn't get to a meeting because she had a child. Um, a lot of what you guys are doing at Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition and other harm reductionists are is exactly that, right? It is kind of like, oh, you've got a sore. Mm -hmm. We need to help with that. Um, do you feel and you're you know you have a fiance who's in medical school, do you feel like the 
the tide is turning um, within the medical establishment. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. We're making we're making a lot of progress. Um, the Karelian Emergency Department in particular has done incredible work over the last few years um, getting Narcan to people who have who have come in with overdose, um, trying to connect people to um, not only treatment, suboxone treatment, they start um, medicated assisted treatment in the emergency room if the client wants it. If they don't want it, they refer them to the drop-in center or to us. So they've been doing a lot of really, really good work. Um, the other thing that harm reduction programs do that are really important is that we are oftentimes the most important work we do is actually patient navigation. We go with the clients to the meeting because um, for people, you know, almost everybody that has substance use disorder also has trauma. Um, nobody gets substance use disorder just cause. Um, people who um, are diagnosed with this and end up addicted to substances are treating a pain either psychologically or physically. And so when they are trying to access services, they um, face a tremendous amount of stigma that exacerbates that trauma and they shut down. So often people with substance use disorder are really difficult clients to work with and they face incredible stigma. I mean, just some of the most inappropriate things have been said in front of me um, in, in certain medical settings. And so what we do is we go there um, as a social and emotional support and also as a translator to say, this is what, you know, they're using all this medical jargon, that's what this means. We affirm them that say, you do not have to do anything you don't want to, you can refuse any service you want to, you can leave against medical advice anytime. Basically, we're just there as their backup, you know? Um, and and that has done wonders for our population. Um, we've been working with the health department to get people tested and treated for hepatitis C. We're doing um, hepatitis and COVID-19 vaccinations um, at our outreach site in, par in, in partnership with the health department. So um, one of the great things about harm reduction is it provides that bridge between kind of the more uh, office-based, bureaucratic, used to things being nice and neat, and like the chaos of the streets. Sure. We try to bridge that. Um, and, and it has been really, really encouraging to see so many medical providers um, really embrace that because they want to help. They want to help the people, but they don't, they don't know what to do. Right, right, and right. many of them weren't, weren't trained to do that. Right. I, I want to make sure that we talk about, you know, your outreach and, and like how it physically takes place with a, with a van full mm -hmm. of supplies and how, where are you, where are you serving people and how do people find you? Yeah, so the best way to find us is actually through our Facebook. We um, are on Facebook both as Virginia Harm Reduction um, as our uh, profile and then Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition as the page that we manage. We also have a website, carrynaloxone.org, that you can look up as well. Um, but the, the way that we reach our people is by going to the places that they are. So we go to a couple of different low-income hotels um, that has high drug activity. Um, most of the people are living in those hotels. We also um, go to a few different sites in Southeast. We kind of follow where the drug overdose map is, where we're seeing the most overdoses. We try to take our van there and, and we put on our Facebook our regular schedule of where we're gonna be. Um, and then we have an office um, in Old Southwest um, for uh, case management. So our clients, it's hard to do case management out of a van. We've done it, but now we have an office. <laughs> it great. is That's possible. Great. Great. And so we do case management work with them um, in our office and they all know that they can come and, and often we'll have to come and pick them up as well because they don't have transportation. All, over 60% of our clients are actually experiencing homelessness. Um, so we just go where, where they congregate and they know we're going to come and they come with their um, one of the cool things what they do is they, they bring their used syringes to us because, uh, you know, needle sticks and, and having syringe litter in a community is dangerous. Um, hepatitis C lasts on a, on a syringe for a really long time. And so what we do is we incentivize them to bring their points back. If they bring back their used syringes, they get an extra bag of unused syringes. So we incentivize um, people who are injecting drugs to bring their points to us so that they don't end up in the community. Right, right, because nobody wants to be cleaning those up for sure. Um, we, we've just got a couple minutes left, but um, Medication assisted treatment we've talked about just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned some of the drugs that the, the medications that are useful for that. You know, traditionally there was methadone clinics where people had to go. Um, 
what, again, fairly short answer, but what do you see as like the big barriers to people getting access to MAT? Uh, getting to the centers, because the centers have to be, so, well, so Suboxone is different from Methadone. Uh, methadone is a higher classified drug, and so it has to be given at a center that is specifically for that drug, whereas Suboxone can be um, prescribed by any medical doctor. Um, and so one of the really great things is that for people that Suboxone works for them, they can get it from an addiction specialist, that we have dozens of them across the city, they can get them from their PCP. Um, but if you're trying to get uh, methadone, you have, the clinic can't be anywhere near a school, a church, anything right, like right. that. We've, and we've seen that in Roanoke before. So they're very far is. away and it's very difficult for our clients to get to them because transportation is such an issue. And unfortunately that's all the time that we have. I'd like to thank Danny Clausen for taking their time from their important work to join me today. If you'd like to learn more, I recommend following the Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition Facebook page and reading one of the many excellent books that have been written in recent years about the opioid epidemic. For What It Takes, I'm Tom Lee.